so. Um, and also I added uh, generalizing human perception of environment. But yes, thank you. So I'm uh, going to present here again my PhD, a small piece of my PhD topic, which I'm working on in the University of Luxembourg. There we have a, a center of contemporary digital history, which, has a, which is a study on digital as a way of interdisciplinarity. So my talk is also, I have a certain pursuit for abstraction here, and it's kind of in this context. Um, also, I'm uh, risking here something which is usually not done in archaeology. I'm not connecting my talk at all to any specific use case or empirical data. And also, I'm talking about a really small element of the general model without really having yet one. First, I'm going to give some co context to talk um, uh, about uh, some general information about my PhD topic. Then I'm going to talk about human perception of environment, how to generalize it in, into one concept, uh, and how to link this to empirical data. And then I'm running a small agent-based modeling test to have some evaluation on, on the meaning of all of this. So, okay. Um, the purpose of uh, the PhD project uh, in general is to create a framework to simulate the emergence of settlement patterns. And it's a lot focused on epistemological issues. And uh, as I said, there is a pursuit for abstraction. And uh, I'm interested in interdisciplinarity regarding the source and theories which I'm going to use and uh, searching for means of comparison between empirical data sets, simulations, and looking for unifying theories. Uh, the, I would say the study area is uh, North European forest zone, boreal forest zone, the Mosolithic and Neolithic. That's mostly made because that's uh, what I know best from archaeology. And um, it's focused on aquatic economies basically shoreline settlement patterns. Uh, there are a lot of actual questions in archaeology, which I keep in mind while doing this. So those, um, those questions are, the first one is the general colonization process of the virgin lands after, after the, <laughs> this works, after uh, ice age ended and uh, and uh, ice sheet melted. Then there was a, there is a theory that there was a localization of settlement patterns, structure, and um, certain onset of aquatic semi-sedentism. And there are also, of course, mythological questions. For example, use of data and theories for ethnoarchaeology and other analog. Then there is, a, like always, an archaeology question of contemporaneity and continuity. Site reuse, and what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is, uh, today is site selection. Fortunately, there has been a lot of discussion already about agent-based models, so there is a very simple slide on this. But basically, what we create while simulating settlement patterns is to create an environment, create an agent, create some rule sets for those, and uh, they mostly are composed on agent decisions regarding each other and regarding environment. Then the simulations are run, observed, measured, theories built, and in good cases there is also comparison and hypothesis testing. Okay, going now to the question of settlement pattern formation. There is a situation that all the agents are located somewhere, then they have either a choice to settle or move somewhere else. And uh, in the geographical theories of migration, there are some push-pull factors, which are a basis of making those decisions. For example, um, when persons turn 18, they have a certain push factor, a social one, to move out of where they are living currently. And there is a reverse force 
because usually the new places having economically worse qualities, no free breakfast and so on. <laughs> so this is all composed always of uh, environmental, functional uh, and social one. And today I'm focusing again only on environmental function. This uh, site selection or environmental function has been so far used a lot in archaeology in kinds of models. So in a lot of agent-based models, the question is actually not relevant at all. But the typical ones where it is relevant are, I would say, optimal foraging theory-related models, where hunter-gatherers move around and search for resources, which guide their movement. And the other one is like um, on a Sasi model had or village ecosystem, that there is a theory of land use. There is some connection to empirical data, usually not statistical connection, and based on this, uh, agents take decisions. So now I have here a proposal to generalize this. First, uh, there's of course a question why, because um, generalizing something like this it would be like a micro simulation approach a bit. But um, I does, don't really mean it like this. This generalization could always mean that the factor I'm going to propose now can be included as a sub-model into the modeling system. And why to do it is, again, that gives a means to compare empirical data versus simulations compare different simulations. For example, there could be very different environmental models. We can then talk about comparing shoreline habitation of Mesolithic to uh, some people who are forced to live in the desert currently. And there are also different subsistence moons, agrarian and the hunter fisher gatherer as well examples. Okay, so now going to the concept. Um, I'm here proposing the use of concept of affordance, which has been actually somewhat used in archaeology already. This um, affordance comes from psychology, Gibson 1979, said that affordance is of the environment and what it offers to the animal, what it provides or furnishes either for good and ill. And, uh, there has been a lot of theory on this later, and it's considered that uh, now that affordance, of course, is a two-directional relationship, so we have to take care um, it into account. And also in archaeology, it has been discussed to use it um, to describe human relation to a place or a, a perception of human of a place. And also it has been used uh, as a defining explanatory purpose of location and predictive models. There's also a very similar concept in ecology called ecofield, which also already includes the concept of emergence in the same, but I'm not going deep into this now. So currently I think that this is a quite perfect um, concept for using an agent-based model because it's uh, related to kind of agent psychology, which is a very much agent-based model approach to things. So uh, the, the question is which places offer good opportunity for habitation? And I'm now talking about the model of residential affordances for agents. And what's interesting now is that we actually have empirical data for this. And uh, this empirical data has been coming a lot from, from the 70s already. It's used from locational models of settlement patterns. Um, of course, it usually works by describing settlement site locations and generalizing it in wider regions. Usually, usually it boils down to soil, topographic features, proximity to water, catchment area maybe. And it's uh, mostly successfully used in uh, CRM, cultural resource management, but also to acquire knowledge about the past. And technically, it's uh, some, usually some sort of linear regression model, which returns in one predictive layer. Uh, when talking about affordances, it's not so simple, of course. Um, but we still, as we can only guess why, we can only 
uh, create kind of a generalized re-description of the situation we know. But, uh, but there are a lot of differences from usual locational models. For example, uh, it's a, always a specific time an agent is around. It's uh, not a long period. There is a causality, for example, veg vegetation often has been sh changed by humans or agents, not vice versa. Also, the affordance uh, changes over time, and some of different time slices actually provides a false model, which requires a sum of models. <coughs> and there are technical details, like here, um, it's, nothing is really visible today, but uh, there is a real red line showing the past shoreline in a certain area, which is not there, so things like this require a lot of multidisciplinary work. And uh, as we are, as I'm now focusing on residential affordance, of course only residential settlement sites are of interest. There is also some interesting requirements by agents. A very technical one for tweaking model, we should maximize recall on, and, uh, on the cost of precision because uh, we are more interested in excluding area not relevant to habitation than vice versa. Precision is not so important. This is not going to be explicit prediction. Um, and uh, to show it on a general kind of view, we have topographic, topographical data, there is the site distribution map, and um, Together with polar geographical data, we can create this predictive af residential affordance model. And now I'm moving on to the, how agent sees it, which I call a potential residential space function. This means how an agent relates to one specific place, how good is the potential of it for an agent. So, um, this affordance is uh, not enough, of course, to have a settlement in itself. There has to be an agent nearby. So uh, this potential residential space becomes one only in the eye of the beholder. And um, I'm proposing here quite uh, a gravity model, basically, which is used in uh, geography. A potential model. And uh, for further work, uh, really it requires some concepts that I will be only working on. And those will be the awareness, which was actually called simulacrum also today, basically. The, um, maybe I will change this a <laughs> But uh, uh, also accessibility, there are all A's. Here is affordance and social functions. And there is some sort of coefficient with the distance square as for um, gravity model. Uh, now, to finish uh, this construct up, I'm uh, testing it, uh, the meaningfulness of this kind of function and uh, affordance with a very simple agent-based model. The model is uh, defined as um, like in economy, usually agents are trying to maximize utility. Then to make it a model of colonization, there is a total push, they always move. And the distance is not taken into account because there should be a theory how they really consider distance to be. So currently it just has to move enough from the, away from the depleted resources to, uh, and not too far. And uh, I know nothing about the awareness currently. And what has to be taken into account that the social function is also simplified. They can't get too close to each other. So it's kind of a push force only between agents. Uh, what I did now is to create uh, randomly generated affordance, residential affordance models, which are not landscapes, but that's how people see landscape coming from economy usually. I give them a bit uh, different characteristic by diusing, uh, diffusing those. And um, then I measure roughness of one run and compare it um, um, 
uh, and also measure nearest neighbor index. So the roughness actually means that I create a dif um, different roster and uh, make a uh, divide standard deviation by mean to normalize this. So all they are in one normalized scale. A nearest neighbor index is a methodology to measure the clusteredness of the points. So now um, I run a bunch of um, simulations. And I can see that the nearest neighbor index is um, clearly correlated with the roughness which is, uh, I don't know, can you see, but visualized here also. And uh, this actually means that uh, more even environments regarding how pleasant they are for um, inhabiting create uh, clustered patterns, while uh, when the residential affordance is um, more rough, uneven, it disperses the communities. So there is some sort of uh, uh, dispersing and clustering force created only by uh, human perception of the environment taking off all the social things. And uh, also, which is interesting for me now, I created a heur heuristic to create an artificial shoreline-based economy. So this light uh, area is... Uh, has a better residential affordance, so they usually move uh, And actually, it uh, very well into the, went into the general model. The results were exactly the same. This is an environment with very high roughness, and it's also dispersing uh, the com communities. So this is actually kind of um, what I'm going to conclude with today. So um, that was a show that this... Um, general measure of potential or residential affordances can be used and it has an impact on settlement patterns. And also, which is quite interesting, is this um, um, creation of clustering and dispersion. To give an example here maybe is that uh, while hunter fisher gatherers were dispersed by environment, and when they started farming, then this affordance, of course, expanded a lot. So there's kind of an environmental force, not force, but yeah, force to create clustering without any social, um, social forces required for this. And it could create a kind of a positive feedback cycle in a wider context of simulation. And that's all. Thank you.